Welcome to today's program hosted by ISM New Jersey. We would like to say hello to all of our ISM members, our chapter partners, all of our guests to today's show. Please be sure to place your comments or questions in the chat function as we would like to make this an interactive program. We're also going to be running some polls today, so we really need your, um, um, if you could, you know, please uh, put your comment, put your uh, responses into the polls because it'll actually um, enhance the program. So today's topic is strategic procurement, and I am pleased to welcome back Graham Crawshaw, who is the Procurement Content Director for CASME. And he, of course, from everybody who has joined us in the past with Graham, know that he is from the UK. Graham has the overall responsibility for the quality of CASMA's global roundtable and virtual events programs. Prior to joining CASMA, Graham spent 20 years working in procurement in the music industry within an operational and marketing environment. At EMI, Graham regularly supported major artists, including I Love This Part, The Beatles, Queen, and Pink Floyd. How exciting. Mm -hmm. In developing and sourcing their unique packaging requirements and subsequently worked on the company's first music streaming contract. Graham is also a fellow of SIPS. I'll now turn the program over to Graham. Excellent. Well, thank you again. And it's great to be here uh, for a, another session. I really appreciate the uh, all the invites and the, uh, the time. Let me just make sure I've got that right. I'm hoping you could see my screen. Is that work OK? Check. Yes, it is. Good. It perfect. Is. Good. Exit. I'd, I'd hate to assume that that was uh, was fine. So you know all about me. So that's um, that's uh, that's great. Let me just spend two minutes setting the scene, giving the context. And if anyone's not familiar with Casme, let you know, because this is where all the information has come from. So I want to make sure it's uh, it's understood. At Casme, we run events and networking sessions on a global basis. We're a global organization and we're very much focused on indirect procurement and supporting category managers. And it's from those events that we're able to produce different insights, different reports, which we then also supplement with benchmarking to really get a pulse of what is going on in procurement. And we are global and, and that's useful for picking up the maturity differences that there are across the world and uh, yet yeah, calling uh, in today from uh, from the UK but uh, also we run events in APAC and and Middle East as well to really know what's going on in procurement. CASME is a, a community and we're made up of around 200 and 30 organizations and how that typically have procurement teams in different regions, different cities. And so it's important to share that logo series because it's from these companies that everything I'm going to be sharing is, is from. This, this is the source data. We're not academics. We don't just make it up. We're really dependent on contributions from all these companies that through attending events, then able to provide that information. So I've got a really good feel what is going on. But you know, the most important piece of information is this slide here. And, and that, oh, wait a minute, what's happened to my screen? Sorry, something's gone very weird. Can you see everything okay? Yes, I, I do see your screen. And, and just the slide, I've got something. It's the peer-to-peer. -peer. Yeah, um, oh, where's, sorry, something has gone wrong with my screen. Bear with me because you can see it, but you know what, I can't. I'm going to stop sharing and resharing. That's always the best way to, to sort these things out. That's it, I'm back with you now. So yeah, the, the apologies there. Um. But I couldn't carry on without seeing the slides. That wouldn't work. Um, the whole main point of CASME is we do not have any sponsors, suppliers, or consultants. It's all peer-to-peer. -peer. So that is the basis of everything that I'm going to share over the next uh, sort of 40-odd minutes or so. And we'll have time for questions. So if you've got questions, please put those in the, um, in the chat. 
And I'm going to go straight in to the, the detail and we'll make these slides available. Uh, I tend to talk quite a fast rate because I'd hate to bore you at any, any point in time. But talking about strategic procurement, so much of it is, is around the actual maturity and the credibility that procurement has. Now, I think we all know that procurement has done well since the pandemic. We've got a greater level of enhanced reputation within the business. People are starting to understand procurement so much better than before the pandemic. So that is a really good positive story. And that's evident on a truly global basis. We are slowly moving away from purely being seen as tactical to becoming much more strategic. And, and that's taking a long time. Now, I've been in procurement a very long time, a good number of years, as you probably gathered, and it's still on a journey. We're not there yet. There is no way you could say procurement is completely strategic. It's, it's evolving, but I think we've made more progress in the last few years than we've made in many uh, previous years. In terms of that maturity, it's all about the ability to get that collaboration right. Because if you've got that collaboration and credibility with stakeholders, it really does make it so much easier than, than if you're trying to constantly fight and have a battle there. And some of the other points that we've, we've covered will, will be evident as we go through this, uh, this presentation. I think also a fair point that, that came from the conversations that we had was procurement is improving its ability to, to gear up, to focus on those projects that really need the support. You may use the word agile. Personally, I think it's an overused word, but that adjustment of resources to be able to come and focus on the priorities is again something that procurement is dramatically in improving on. Helps if I go the right way. Um, continuing that, we are seen as much more a business partner where we've got knowledge that the business respects. I think talent, and I've got some more slides on, on that, that also is, is a factor when it comes to the maturity of, of procurement. And, and that's a really difficult one because there's such a shortage of people at the moment, shortage of people that really have got those right skills, that it really becomes quite a minefield for actually providing that, um, that support. Again, when looking at the maturity of procurement, the focus on cost savings versus other value comes into play. Now, I would say, from work that we've very recently done, more companies now are going back to quite aggressive cost savings. And I think that's necessary because suppliers have been using inflation to, to justify, or maybe not justify, but have certainly used inflation as a reason for increasing pricing and therefore being much more focused on putting pressure back on the suppliers to justify change and hopefully getting some cost savings is going to be very, uh, very valid. I like the phrase that came through. We were all talking and continue to talk about analytics and procurement. Those organizations that are becoming much more mature are really focused on analytics. It's not just spend management, not just understanding suppliers, but that whole spectrum of being able to have a real good feel for what is going on with the suppliers, with spend, whether it's tail spend, whether it's spend through catalogs, just being able to be in control of all that data. That really does signify that you're becoming much more mature as an organization. And then also the whole concept of supplier stakeholders and also procurement, working almost as a triangle, working together to, to really be able to have conversations, understand business objectives, understand what's going on. Again, the maturity there is, is, is where it can be evident um, how procurement is, is doing. 
we've got some polls today. I was determined you're not just going to listen to me talking for the time. Let's get something uh, much more sort of interactive. And I'm um, just make sure we launch the right poll. Uh, let's go into the first poll and launch that. And the question's quite straightforward. Um, what we'd like you to do is to what extent has the assessment of procurement's maturity and the strategic value changed during recent events? Probably since the pandemic, truth, uh, truth be known. So I've, I've told you what I've seen and what we've heard from the 230 CASME members, but do you agree? Is that your experience within your organization? So now the first poll to give a feel for your, your views. And of course, it's just a personal view from your organization. Uh, delighted to say we've got uh, 30, 36 of us on the, uh, the call uh, today. So thank you for spending this time. And um, that means that it's really useful to get a bit of, uh, bit of useful data on, on this. So thank you for, for responding. And I'm going to share the results. Interesting. So 61% of you have said that it's improved moderately. Then 22% saying improved significantly. And then 17% improved minimally. I'm pleased to say you've all been on the positive side. No one says it's remained the same or, or decreased. So I think that shows however mature your function is, you're going in the right direction, which is really encouraging, uh, encouraging news. So let me stop sharing that uh, that poll. We've got a couple of other polls coming up later in the uh, presentation. Let's look in more detail. After we looked at overall maturity, we at our round tables, and this is essentially what I'm reporting on, looked at strategic development. And, and which of those factors really indicates that procurement is becoming more of a strategic function. And, and you can see, and I, I promise I'm not going to read all these slides, and I'll just tell more of a, a story as we, as we go through. But you can see here, these first five indicators that really show the positioning. I think some of it does depend where procurement reports into, as to whether it is the, the highest level, the CEO, or whether it's reporting into finance or whether it's reporting into another function like operations or supply chain. And I think a lot of it also depends how well the function that it reports into respects procurement. And if you've got a finance function that doesn't really understand procurement, I know how difficult it can be. I've been there in a past career. So you were in a much uphill struggle because the, the reporting line you're all thinking about from a finance point of view rather than from a procurement point of view. And we know if you've not got that senior level support, life is just much harder. So we really do want to get to a position that you've got that senior support, you've got the right reporting, and you've got the engagement with other functions. And that's difficult. It's not easy to actually achieve that. It's easy for me to say, but actually to have that working relationship with organizations or functions such as legal, such as HR or IT, probably the three hardest ones to really maintain, then it's you really do need that because otherwise it becomes very difficult when the business itself then tries to split the work of procurement and perhaps potentially sort of bypass um, as well. So that's that's often another one that indicates in terms of strategic. If we look at the factors from six to 10, then again, these are more indicators that the function is being strategic. And again, I'm hoping that you recognize and are doing some or, or most of these, uh, these activities. Because without that communication, without that representation at the right meetings, you're facing an uphill struggle. The cost savings one, as I indicated, because of high inflation, I think we're becoming more aggressive. But cost savings is just one area of value that we deliver. I think procurement is known 
unfortunately just for cost savings and all the other value is often secondary, which is really, really frustrating. And unfortunately, as time and pressure comes on the business, then it's still the cost savings that generate all the, the conversation. I think those companies that really are becoming more strategic have got better at communicating and certainly areas like risk, where it's very difficult to put a dollar amount. It's, it's a way of having those conversations and say, you know what, we're delivering this value. Without what we're doing, you won't get all this activity done. So considerations for the continued strategic recognition. And I'm sure you're doing many of these, but this is what procurement is saying is, is going on. And whether it is improving those partnerships, getting involved in continuity plans, getting involved in early projects. This is, there's no simple answer. There's no easy fix. And it takes time to build the relationships. It takes time to get involved, but there's no real other way. There's no quick fix. Procurement isn't rocket science, but having done it for so long, I really do think the skill is all about the relationships and using that to uh, to really help. Sorry, my mouse keeps going the wrong way tonight. I don't quite know why why that is the case. I would say more companies are focused on establishing a center of excellence. Now, even if you're a small company or smaller company, that center of excellence, it may be one person, but it's someone dedicated to making sure consistency of approach across categories and providing the tools to support procurement. For larger companies, of course, it's a much bigger team and they can be positioned anywhere in the world. I think that's also a change since the pandemic. The center of excellence can be virtual. It doesn't need all to be, uh, be the same. I think collaboration we've spoken briefly of, but that's so important to, to get that right. And unfortunately, we're all dealing with a situation that stakeholders within the business seem to change very regularly. And if you're supporting a category like marketing, it can be very frustrating when just as you've won someone over, you then get someone new in that also comes up with a wonderful idea of introducing new marketing agencies. And I know I've been in that situation where you've looked for that brick wall to bang your head against. I think we're good at being patient. We're good at starting and really trying to continue to build those relationships because sadly, I don't think there's another approach. It's got to be about winning people on board and actually getting them converted into working in the way that you want them, uh, want them to. We know that outsourcing and business process outsourcing is, is very much part of strategic development for, for many organizations. There's the balance between what do you want to outsource and how do you want to outsource it? And we know the rules are that you don't outsource a problem. If you haven't got the process in place, then fix it, then outsource it. Um, that's definitely uh, a lesson that I think most of us have, have learned in the, uh, the, the hard way. We also know that just outsourcing to a BPO or to a supplier, it's not only that it's not the only answer. One of the challenges can be that maybe it makes sense to bring elements back in house. Certainly, you don't want to be in a situation where all the experience and knowledge of what you've outsourced is lost to the suppliers. That also could be quite a challenge for those companies that have just outsourced and then suddenly realize their internal team is so lean, so thin that actually the knowledge is lacking, which can cause a, uh, a problem and therefore hinder development. And so it continues, even more opportunities here for the, uh, the outsourcing and the way to uh, look at some of the, uh, the options. I won't go through all of those. I think we covered it. This is the list of where we think that we can add value beyond cost. And, and these have come as a result of, of benchmarking many hundreds of category managers to get a feel for what they see as being most important. 
Um, I'm not surprised that risk management and cost avoidance is on the, the list. We've had more conversations about cost avoidance over the last sort of year than probably ever before because it can be difficult to get the savings, yet you still are putting time and effort to reducing increased prices. And, and that's just the way that, that it seems to have gone with such levels of inflation that we've not seen before. But of course, remember, your supplier, the sales representatives and the supplier also has not really got the experience of selling goods and services with such high inflation. So we're almost in it together, but that could well mean that the cost avoidance that you achieve, assuming that it's not a cost saving, that needs to be reported and really demonstrated as a great value that you're able to, uh, to deliver to the business. Let's continue. How can you demonstrate by uh, delivering the, some of these, uh, these cost savings? And these were some ideas that have been put forward by procurement professionals. So again, it's not textbooks. It's not just someone doing some an analysis to come up with this. This is what procurement category managers have said, that how they're delivering the, uh, the, the value beyond um, cost savings. Number one, being very much the focus on simplification, then moving to trying to get some leverage consistency across business units, for, uh, for example, then monitoring suppliers, assisting stakeholders, and then optimizing supplier performance. Again, each of those very important to, uh, to get right. The list then uh, continues of some of those other areas. Getting finance on board, mentioned that already, absolutely, uh, absolutely critical. I've talked about the cost avoidance and, and so it goes on. So I think procurement is in that very strong position to be able to deliver that uh, value. And if you're not doing all of those, then I hope that list becomes a bit of a, a checklist. That strategic value also comes into play when talking about ESG and sustainability strategies. And it's a complex area. And I must admit, the areas that I've been talking over the last month is from procurement teams that almost struggling. If you're not careful, ESG and all the projects associated with it can really dominate and take over. And it can't all be down to procurement. Similarly, with risk, that's the same. The risk, the number of risks has absolutely exploded in the last few years and procurement seems to be involved. So whether it's a risk around GDPR, around modern day slavery, child labor and financial stability of suppliers, suddenly we've got all that to take on board. So I think it's a question of really making sure that you don't try to achieve everything, but really understand what, what's the business say the priority is. Because otherwise, with ESG, you can just go off at a tangent and, and get very carried away. We're doing a lot of work. And I do know from some people, they say it's almost a distraction because of all the other work they're trying to achieve. So that may not be a politically correct statement, but I think it's the reality that many organizations are, are facing at, at the moment. But there are some things that you can do. And I think this chart nicely summarizes what is viable to achieve through ESG, knowing that you can't do everything. Now, typically, when I have these conversations, I think it's fair to say that because the US is so more advanced than the rest of the world on diversity, Often diversity and ESG and all the other sustainability matters, they always can go hand in hand. And if you've got the systems for supporting diversity, then try and introduce that for sustainability. In Europe and APAC, there isn't that luxury. Diversity isn't as mature because that definition just isn't in place. And so if anything, ESG is the leading uh, focus for organizations, and diversity is just part of that. It's worth appreciating that 
certainly when it comes to looking at systems and tools that you may wish to uh, to invest in. Let's see, I think I've got some more of, um, of those points. No, we're on to um, on the, to the second poll. So let's uh, yes, time goes on. Let's uh, let's keep the energy levels go. Let me get the second poll ready and launched. We've been talking about strategic value. So which of the following are being measured to evaluate procurement's strategic value? And in this poll, you can answer as many as you would like. So the options that you've got are strategic satisfaction, consolidation of the supply base, continuity of supply, improved risk assessment, alignment of the supply chain, consistency in ESG, improved stakeholder and supplier collaboration and delivery of supplier innovation. Give me some thought, don't just tick them all because actually you could argue they're all relevant, but I think which are most important to you and, uh, and your organization. So, um, and, uh, and Kim, yes, you will, will, will get a, a copy of the presentation to you. I've just seen that uh, question uh, come up. So uh, yeah, definitely uh, I'll arrange that through, uh, through Kathy at the end, because yeah, I'm talking quite quickly and most of these are checklists. So you can study that at your leisure rather than me going through every single uh, single point. Thank you. We've got almost 40 people on the call. So again, it's really useful to give you some immediate feedback because this is what you were saying are a, the, the ways of evaluating strategic value. Thank you for those that have responded. I'm going to end the poll there and share the results. I'm not surprised. Continuity of supply is the longest line. Ignore the percentages because you've been able to add in um, more, uh, more than one. So Zoom can't cope with the percentages. So longest bar charts here, continuity of supply, then um, improved risk assessments. Uh, and then we've got stakeholder satisfaction. So I think consistency with really what the emphasis that I've been trying to give as we go through this uh, this presentation. Continuity of supply is still a challenge for so many organizations. We think that because the pandemic is over, just about, we think that because the Ukraine-Russian war has been going on for over a year, that, that some of these issues have gone away. Well, they haven't. Some are managing them better than others, but there is still an imbalance of supply and demand for many commodities and components. You've still got a disruption because of the, the war. You've still got disruption because of the, the slow recovery of China as a result of the pandemic and then everything else that's threatening to disrupt what's going on in procurement. So again, hopefully that uh, chart there is a, a useful one just to uh, to give you a feel for what we're seeing here now, this group, as the procurement's strategic value. Let's continue. At our roundtables and discussing this, we did a lot in terms of stakeholder and um, supplier engagement. I, I think this is what we're good at. Anyone in procurement, you talk about the skills, you talk about what we need to do, but it's this engagement, it's building relationships. That's the main skill that we've got. Of course, you've got, you've got all the others that go around, but we are very good at the relationships with both stakeholders and suppliers, using different language to translate each other's requirements and, and that's really where the, the, the skill comes. So this chart is, is a result of that conversation where we're really trying to duck, sort of deduce what's, uh, what's going on and, and how that engagement should, um, should look like. And I think it starts with stakeholder mapping. As the phrase goes, you can't keep everyone happy all the time. It's a question of like, well, who are you going to focus on? Which stakeholders are more likely to be able to influence that you want to uh, to work with and and so it's 
question of, of being selective. Who do you want to meet at that coffee machine, that water cooler? It is so important to, um, to, to get right. And some of these ideas are, are how procurement is telling us those engagements are going on. And so it, it continues with different I ideas, very much wanting to be involved with, with meetings, whether it's supply relationship management, whether it's annual strategy meetings. And I know that sounds a lot of work, but ultimately, if you're not in it, if you're not there, if you're not engaged, that's the point that you're just going to really struggle to demonstrate that really you are there to contribute from the uh, from the outset. And so it um, so it goes on. Um, we talk about skills for procurement. I've been talking about relationships. And, and so we specifically did some benchmarking. We said, look, what skills do procurement professionals really need? And, and here are the top five that um, to begin with. And what's interesting is that it's very much about relationship skills. It's not about completing purchase orders. It's not really about negotiation. It's about that relationship management, those soft skills that really enable you to, to talk your way into meetings, to talk your way into convincing suppliers. And um, whether it's effective listening, because let's face it, listening's even more important than talking at times. Um, I know that because I've been married 30 years, but it's so important to have that business acumen, to know what you're talking about, and recognize that the suppliers are there to provide that knowledge that you can then use when having conversations with, um, with stakeholders. The list continues. Data analytics is becoming more and more important. And yeah, we can get some tools to help us, but going into the stakeholders with knowledge, with data to actually prove what they're doing and enlighten them for the first time. Again, you'd think we'd be doing, would have done this like 20 years ago, but I hear so many stories of companies that say it's only now that through the investment in systems, they've got the ability to really understand the spend by supplier, cut, slicing and dicing it in a way that they can then produce the right reports to go and explain to the stakeholders. And stakeholders generally have got no idea where the money is being spent. You talk about a category like marketing and just the sheer number of marketing agencies, the spend, the flow through spend, the agencies control. It's, it's really enlightening if you're able to get that data, get that granularity of what is being purchased and, and how is it actually being, uh, being sourced. So again, yeah, these back to the skills, cultural awareness, I think is very important, especially for anyone operating on a, a global basis. Personally, one of my favorites is number 10, that ability to influence without authority. If you've got a mandate to have procurement, then it can almost be a distraction. I would say from all the procurement functions I talk to, it's those that don't have a mandate, or if they do, they keep it in the bottom drawer. It's about influencing, about relationships. That's really the future of procurement. And that separates those companies that are much more strategic in their thinking than those that are much more tactical. Let's move on from internal stakeholders more to, to suppliers. And we know that supply relationship management is so important. Not every company does it. You certainly don't do it to all your suppliers. You have that subset of list of suppliers that it's so important to actually get right. But these are some of the guidances that we're, we're seeing that procurement is talking about, whether it is documenting and having a formal SRM program, letting the suppliers know they're part of that program, letting them know what's in it for them and what your expectations are setting it out in the formal meetings and really understanding the value that can be delivered. Now, I know we have a lot of conversations that sort of it's hard to put a return on investment on supplier relationship management. And I'm trying to avoid acronyms tonight, today. Um, 
it's really difficult to actually put that return on investment. But all, all the examples that I hear about, those companies that actively select a number of suppliers and say, yeah, we're going to work with them. We're going to get that meeting structure in place, share objectives, understand how they can really help us. That really does pay, pay dividends. That's where the benefit and the value comes. First evidence during the pandemic, but it's continued as we do really seem to go from one crisis to uh, to the next. The next list um, changes to those uh, programs specifically fo focusing on 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 risk. So again, the top five items that our members fed back on, looking at that risk and and understanding that whole risk issue. Because let's face it, when you talk about risk management. It, it can always be too general. It's it's over. Everyone knows about it, but it's the detail where it really is is important. And again, that's why we've come up with that list of where where you should really focus when it comes to looking at, um, at risk management. Strategic procurement is all about collaboration. It's all about the relationships, and and I really. I know I'm emphasizing that, but it's so important to get that right. And, and I think people that don't have it right are those that really then struggle to say, well, the suppliers aren't really understanding. They're not responding to what we actually do need. So this is a list here of when we asked, well, how can you collaborate and get that strategic alignment between stakeholders and suppliers. Different ways of doing it, whether it is looking at uh, the collaboration for innovation, whether it is hosting those, uh, those meetings, or whether it is that three-way relationship of getting everybody together, procurement, the business and the stakeholder, but letting procurement sort of facilitate those uh, conversations. After all, that's what we're really good at, um, at developing and doing. Poll number three, let's, um, and this is the, the final one for today. Um, <clears throat> let me launch that one. So which trends or events have had the most uh, per pervasive future impact on strategic procurement? And again, you could answer all of these, no doubt, but we want to keep you to the top three that are important to your organization. What is having the most impact on procurement? The influence, the way that you intend to be operating over the next, say, 12 to, uh, to 18 months. So think through the top three. So whether it is the Russia-Ukraine war impact, inflation, Digitalization, and again, what a word that's used for so much, but I see that as just implementing systems to really help procurement or doing something differently in terms of technology. With supply chain disruption, pandemic recovery, still an important one in, in many parts of the world, supply relationship management, issues around retaining and recruiting talent, labor shortages, ESG compliance and overall procurement's strategic partnership roles. I'm going to give you a few more seconds. The top three would be really interesting to get a view from this particular uh, group. So we've got 40 of you on the call. So it's great. I think that's uh, a good enough number to actually give it, give something um, something meaningful. And uh, I might see, I'll have a chat with Cathy in a bit and we'll see if we can actually use some of these polls in a, a LinkedIn promotion bit for the uh, the New Jersey chapter of, uh, of ISM. Because it's really good to understand what you guys are actually thinking. I think that's given you enough time to, uh, to respond. So let me end the poll and share the results. I'm not surprised, inflation, there it is, number one. And I think that's going to be there. That's going to be an impact for the next, I don't know, best of 2023. We're in April now for anyone listening to the recording. And I envisage for the next eight, probably 12 months, inflation is still going to be a, a serious issue, even if it's not the chaos or the crisis that it was towards the end of 2022. We know commodities have come down in price, 
but it's down to procurement to make sure that you can negotiate out any unnecessary price increase. So inflation, the longest bar, again, you could ignore the percentages because you're responding to more than one. Then, um, check my uh, <laughs> line of sight here, labor shortages followed by supply chain disruption. So really interesting there. I'm, I'm fascinated that the ESG compliance isn't on the agenda or the wavelength for, for anyone there. So that's a, that's an interesting one. Others like labor shortages um, and still to a certain extent, supply chain disruption and Ukraine war is having a, an impact. So I think that's really, I like sharing this data because that's that's what you are thinking at this precise time. So it's it's very current. I'll, I'll stop sharing uh, there. So thank you for all contributing towards the polls today. As I draw to the end of the presentation, I do want to talk a bit on trends and technology. And I think information is power, is, is very relevant at, uh, at any stage, but even now, and we're often asked, well, how does procurement get all its information? Um, and Hack and Kathy, don't shoot me, but I could see Chartered Institute of Procurement to Supply at number three. It was genuinely a global survey, I promise. So I don't know why ISM isn't on the list. Those are the top eight. And then we go to the, the top 15 there. So the organizations that really help procurement in terms of information that you could use when doing your strategic role. So worth having a, a, a look at some of those, the, the links are uh, live, but uh, that is honestly the responses from probably about 200 CASME members that responded to the survey that we did on, the, on this, uh, this topic. So that's the view that they see in terms of getting market intelligence to get that information, that knowledge, that power to be able to accurately go back to the business and, um, and really get that message, a, uh, message across. Technology solutions is the buzzword. You're hearing it at all conferences. Everyone is talking about it. I would also say there's a lot of frustration. There's a lot of concern that implementing systems is lengthy, it's costly, time consuming and frustrating. You don't hear that generally from the suppliers promoting those systems, but in almost all cases, and we've done some very recent benchmarking that really demonstrated the frustration of implementing some digitalization or systems, it's, it's very frustrating. I was asked only last week, how is procurement doing with uh, chat GPT? And it's like, you know what? At best, we're playing with it. I mean, it's fun to type in some questions, but we're not seriously using it yet to help us formulate contracts or even red line contracts. But it will be here. I think before you do anything, have you got the basics covered? Have you got the clean data to know what you're buying? And I'm not doing that as a poll question, but when we've studied this area, so many organizations are still struggling with the basics that there's no point in talking about blockchain and some of the other extreme higher technologies for, for supporting procurement. It's, it really is very much a journey but it's on the way. So my message would be just sort of invest in what you can. Get some systems, whether it's implementing catalogs, which is probably number one for most organizations, or some other sort of system that's helping, whether it's risk or environmental. Maybe you're using Ecovardis um, or one of the other systems to help you gather data to be able to do some of your ESG reporting. A lot of frustration. The perception is everyone is much more advanced. That's rarely in practice. It's not really the, uh, the, the, the case. Yeah, online catalogs, this is much more likely what people are focusing on um, and, and getting that so that it becomes easier for your users to actually make purchases. 
And if you want to be more adventurous, then invest in some chatbots to perhaps give your stakeholders some instant answers to some of their questions. But it's got to work. Otherwise, you're just going to frustrate. We've all used those systems, the virtual assistants, systems that are pretty useless, and it can be very, very frustrating. We asked, what are some good practices if you're developing a technology strategy? And in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all those, but I think that's a useful checklist for you to actually see that has come from procurement to actually support the, the development of a, a technology strategy. We've got two uh, slides of, of those. Um, yeah, too many words. You've, you've listened to me enough, so I'm not going to read those out. But separately, if that's of interest to you, use those as a bit of a checklist. Talent, we also spoke about that earlier. Future trend, we've got to get the talent right. We've got to get the people right that are going to work in procurement. We need people with skills around ESG. They may not be very advanced skills, but we need people that have perhaps worked in that area in a different other in a different organization. I think for procurement, we have still got a lot of work to do to make it a an attractive function for young talent young early careers to want to work in. We're not there yet. We're not doing a good sales job of procurement. That's just people still falling into it or choosing to work for finance or legal. We've got to do something more. And I know ISM continues to do a lot. SIPS is doing a lot. But it's an uphill, uh, an uphill struggle because we're still overcoming that perception of procurement not being strategic. But if you can attract early careers people into procurement, develop their career, then what a place to, uh, to work. Why would you want to work in any other function? But I'm preaching to the choir or the converted there, so apologies there. But I think you know it is about taking that enthusiasm and really wanting others to, um, to get involved and be part of the organization. Last two slides, hot topics in procurement. I wanted to add this in because we've just done some benchmarking across all of our members in March, where we said, what are you working on for the next 18 months? And in fact, you know what? I think my second slide, let's, let's go straight to that. This is the response that they gave. So it's very, very current and ESG is right at the top of the list, as is inflation. So that ties in quite nicely with the poll results that we've been looking at uh, today. I'm not surprised. Cost saving is, is firmly on that list as procurement needs to focus on, on that. But I think look at it as a whole. These are the areas that procurement trying to continue that journey to be strategic to keep the pressure, to keep the organization engaged with us. This, this is where procurement is planning to work on over the next 18 months. So if you've got a list that's different from this, then ask yourself why. But I'm almost guaranteed that your list is, is resembles very strongly, very closely with, um, with that list there. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to stop sharing. I've been talking for 50, well, 50 minutes. So uh, thank you for, for, for staying with me on that. I'm going to get Kathy back in to see if we've got any questions, get any observations. And I always like, if you disagree with anything that I've said to, today, then by all means, let me know, say in the chat. But let me just remind you, as always, anything I say isn't my thoughts. It's not me making it up. This is a result of many, many conversations from different uh, events that procurement professionals have, have attended. So it's very much the pulse of procurement. And I'm hoping that it's been a value to understand what we're saying is strategic procurement today and the direction that we're going in. So, Kathy, I hope that's uh, that's been of interest. And uh, again, great doing the polls. Thank you, everyone, for their contribution there. It was really, uh, really insightful. And um, yeah, if there are any questions, we should uh, we, we can have a look at them. 
Uh, just one, well, so far, just one comment. It was in the uh, regards to the third poll. Uh, this person, uh, Steve, mentioned yes. tensions with China. Maybe that should have been on the list. Totally agree, Steve. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, it's it's only only with hindsight when we're developing these lists. You're right, and that tension is sort of definitely bubbling under the uh, the surface. I think actually you probably could think of quite a few more that should be uh, should be on the list. I have a sneaky feeling that Zoom only allows us to have ten, and that's probably one of the more practical reasons. But yeah. It just shows you there's there's quite a um, a number there that uh, that's that's good. But thank you for for sharing uh, sharing that. If anyone else has got any others, then please put those in the uh, the chat as well. Yeah, please do uh, put any questions or if you have any comments about the presentation. You know, we definitely would love love to hear from you. Um, and we will be. Somebody did ask a question. We will be definitely sending out a copy of the presentation. All the attendees do get receive a copy of the recording, which hopefully I'll have it posted today. And uh, and then everybody gets uh, credit for attending today, too. So every time you attend one of our webinars, you get educational credit. So that's always um, a good thing for especially for those doing certifications. Yes. Yeah, I think that is so, uh, so important to get that uh, that accreditation. Um, so, uh, yeah, demonstrates that you're uh, uh really sort of uh, on, en engaged and keeping your information fresh which is good and that's why i was really keen to share that very latest poll that we've got and i saw that i thought yeah i think everyone would uh would uh, appreciate uh, that so uh yeah i can see the uh the, the comments uh words of encouragement thank you kim yeah i'm booked in in fact we should do a quick sales pitch shouldn't we um you were saying kathy when am i next supporting one of your chapter events Actually, I was gonna date. I was I was gonna mention it. Graham will hey, be back yeah. on June twenty second. And he's gonna um let me see. I don't think I have the, the topic though. Um he's gonna be he will be back on June twenty second. I don't think we have the topic um unless we just did the did we just well, I, uh I did send you the thing. I think it's on supply did. relationship management. Uh, that's what is it there? is. Yes, that's what it is. Again, I didn't actually the very have latest it down. thinking. Um, so, um, so yeah, Kim, I've, I've did one presentation to the Arizona um, chapter. Very happy if there's any other chapters. Um, I mean, Kathy keeps me so busy, but always willing to uh, to help uh, others. I'm in conversation with the Dallas uh, chapter as well. That will be a new one. But I've done South Florida. I've done uh, done quite a few. You know what we just I well I particularly I just like sharing I mean I could talk about procurement all day Kathy knows that and I think some of you that have been to a, a number of my presentations know that it's such a great discipline to work in and I, I think it's right that within the procurement community we should share and and really improve and, and just really understand what everyone else is is doing so always very keen to uh uh to do that which is why i like uh sort of coming along so always appreciate the uh the invitation oh definitely definitely believe me grandma will be coming back because we uh <laughs> we do value all the information and um all the uh the the, the surveys that the organization does to you know bring it and educate us as well excellent well you're very welcome there's, there's lots of really nice comments, which I do do appreciate, but don't want to take up anyone's time. But if you've got any questions, then um, also put those in or any other comments um, in terms of. Um... Oh, one question came in. What is a place of strategic procurement for startup? Sorry, Kathy, could you repeat that again? Sorry. OK, what is a place of strategic procurement for startup? Um, I'm, I'm struggling to, uh, you mean startup companies or where, how to start up in procurement? Um, I would, sorry. I would think maybe startup companies, but, uh, Jonas, if you could just uh, clarify that in the chat, that would be great. And then, or is uh, it for, um, for a company that's introducing procurement for the, uh, the first time, if it is for startup organizations, I think there's a great opportunity to almost start as you mean to go on um oh yeah for startup uh, companies thank you uh, thank you Jonas um my my understanding my my take on on sort of this for startup companies is very much the 
opportunity to share with um, other business stakeholders that almost involve procurement from the outset is, is such a good thing. I think all of those apply. It's just, even if you're a much smaller organization, it, it still applies and it's just the different scale. I often think if, you, if you're adding an extra zero to the spend level, really the principles are all the same. The work is all the same. So whether you're actually spending 1 million, 10 million or 100 million or a billion, so many of the principles, if you get them embedded in the organization from the outset, then um, then sort of work, uh, work well. I, I can relate to, I mean, I've been working with that uh, very large search engine company for a very, very long time when essentially they were still starting up. And you may not implement category management from the outset, they didn't, but you could have some of the principles and some of the processes in place so that you then build that spend knowledge and, and then you've got something to give back and to share with the uh, stakeholders. So that would be, that's my thought and my experience of dealing with uh, startup uh, companies. Well, I think uh, just a lot of thank yous and, uh, you know, appreciate the uh, the content for today. So thank you, Graham. Um, at You're this point, we'll, um, we only actually have a three minutes left, but at this point, I'll probably close out the program. Just want to appreciate everybody for joining us today. And of course, you, Graham, for bringing this presentation. And believe me, tune in on June 22nd. You don't want to miss it. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you all, and goodbye for now. Okay, bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>